What a crazy time to be a Christian. How many of y'all are following kind of the buzz in Christendom right now? You've got the uh, Day of Atonement coming up in the end of this month, and you've got the blood moon cycle, and you've got all this chaos going on in the world today, and you've got all of these folks that are just saying something's happening, something's happening, something's happening. Now, I'm not one of those guys that's going to get ultra specific on you. I don't know exactly what the Almighty is doing, but I will not lie to you. I definitely sense that this is a significant season for the people of God, and this is our opportunity. Remember this, when there's chaos in the world, chaos in the culture never equals chaos in the kingdom. Chaos in the culture never equals chaos in the kingdom. The Lord is not wringing his hands. He is executing all things according to his divine decree. He knows what he's doing. You know what your job and my job is? To discern it, to humble ourselves, and to get in on whatever the Lord is doing in this generation. Amen. Mark 6, verse 1. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon, and are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. Now watch verse number five. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about the villages teaching And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. You've already come to a crisis of faith at least once this year. Some of you are in one right now. What am I talking about? It's those moments, those seasons, those circumstances where you have questions that are unanswered, unanswered, needs uh, to which provision is not yet materialized, um, obstacles, whether in your body, your mind, your marriage, your relationships, your finances, obstacles that seem to loom larger than the promises of God. And so often we come in these situations and these seasons of life, and when they are prolonged, because anybody can stand a trial for six hours, any believer can. But when those six hours turn into six days, six weeks, and six months, it beats down on our faith. And it is harder at times to trust God in the middle of something than it was in the beginning of something. And if we fail to trust him in the middle of a testing season, we'll never make it through to the end of that testing season. I think that the text that is before us helps us to see an element that we don't talk about enough, I don't talk about enough in this pulpit. One of the reasons why is that I am a big grace guy. I I just believe so strongly in the sovereignty of God that at times in my heart there would be the tendency in ecstatic moments of worship to say it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't matter what I say, it doesn't matter what I attempt because you are gloriously good, you are high and lifted up, you are exalted above measure, and you will work all things according to the counsel of your will. And it actually brings a rest to my soul. And by the way, that's actually really good theology, but the difficulty is this. The difficulty is when we let that theology determine the level of our commitment in the kingdom. In other words, it all depends on you, God, therefore I just will wait around and see what you do. 
So today, if I've ever left anyone with the impression that a good understanding of the sovereignty of God has attached to it an apathy in the kingdom, let me undo that knot this morning. Let me untie that because I want to show you right from here that what God does is often contingent upon what you believe he will do. What we see from the hand of omnipotence is sometimes determined of what we believe about the heart of the one who is omnipotent. More than once, Jesus would say to people, be it unto you according to your faith. Jesus looked at individuals and said, I am going to give you all that you believe me for. And at other times, as in this passage, he marveled because people wouldn't believe him and they got nothing. So, Let's see what the scriptures say this morning. That's enough of my intro. Let's look at the crowd that day in verses 1 through 3. We're talking about the way it works, and it begins with a crowd one day gathered around Jesus. And in that crowd, there were people that were students of Jesus. Verse number 1 very simply says that as Jesus was moving through a ministry phase, he went away from where he was, and he comes to his hometown. Mark that down. He's gone back to Nazareth, by the way, for the final time in his earthly journey. It's his hometown, and his disciples followed him there. Now, about a year earlier, Jesus had gone into Nazareth at the beginning of his ministry. And he goes there among the people with whom he grew up, the people that watched him as a boy and as a teenager, the people that watched him be an apprentice in Joseph the carpenter shop, the people that watched him in his 20s take over a carpentry or a building enterprise. Jesus was, humanly speaking, a blue-collar worker. Nothing impressive. There's nothing that, of any indication that in his first 30 years of life outside of that moment at the temple when he was 12, there's no indication that Jesus was drawing Messiah-like attention to himself. He was kind of incognito, almost quiet. He was so benign that people were shocked when he comes into his hometown and he starts speaking with the wisdom of God. A year prior to this passage, they had looked at him, they had listened to him, And he taught in the synagogue from the first couple of verses of Isaiah 61. He rolled up the scroll and he says, today this is fulfilled in your ears. And his hometown folks knew that he was claiming Messiahship. And their response to his offer of the kingdom was to try to kill him that day. Do you remember in Nazareth that day they tried to take him and throw him over a cliff? They so wanted to kill him that he left, he disappeared in their midst. We don't know exactly what happened, but he left and he hadn't been back and since here. And here we are a year later. Look at his grace. He's going to offer himself again to people who had previously rejected him. And in the crowd that day are some of his learners, some of his students. Some people that for the better part of a year, maybe even two years, had heard Jesus teach, had watched Jesus heal. They had been called to leave their jobs. They had been called to leave their responsibilities, to give up their business enterprises and to follow him. And so they had done that. They had forsaken all and they were students of Jesus, but also in the crowd. And they're the ones we want to talk about today. We're in verse two, the people that were skeptical about Jesus. Look in verse number two. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works being done by his hands? Now, just pause there for a minute. There's nothing wrong with asking questions about Jesus. I think um, a curious mind is, can be a gateway to regeneration. Uh, We can't take it for granted that we live any longer in a culture where people just lock, stock, and barrel understand the gospel because it's part of our culture. Those days are over. Those that are faithful to the gospel now are actually anti-culture. We're now the rebels in the culture, those of us that believe the biblical gospel. But in that day, you had a group of people, and they're there in the synagogue, and Jesus is preaching. He's preaching, he's teaching, and he's there in his own hometown, and the people are saying, what is this? They're baffled by him. Look at the questions that they ask there. They ask, what, where did this man get these things? The first question is where? Where are you getting your teaching from? They knew that he hadn't been a student of the rabbis. They knew that he hadn't been trained uh, in the law as would a professional clergyman of that day. They, they were wondering, where did you come up with the stuff? Where are you getting your wisdom from? The second question is like the first. What is this wisdom getting to him? They're saying, I, we, we've not heard things. Remember the testimony of Jesus was that when he spoke, the testimony even of those that didn't necessarily believe him said, we've never heard anybody speak like this before. 
He was distinct and different from all of the other teachers of his day. It is highly likely it is because he was, the moment at his baptism, he was indwelled by the Holy Spirit. And so what came out of him was not man's best, but what came forth from him as the son of man was teaching that would come forth when one is completely filled with and yielded to the Holy Spirit. Never forget that. Jesus in his humanity was spiritually filled by the Holy Spirit from the moment of his baptism. And so we see the next question was, how are these mighty works done by him? Well, we're not told that in the synagogue that day he did any mighty works, but his fame had gone about. And so they're asking questions. And one might think they're the legitimate questions. They're saying, where are you getting your teaching material? Where do you get this wisdom? And how are you doing the miracles that you're doing? But we're going to find out in a moment that they weren't asking because they wanted answers. They were asking, assuming that no answers could be given. These were not questions of hunger and curiosity. We're going to find out in a moment that these were closed down hearts. Let me just say something, especially if you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus Christ. Questions are allowed. If you're a Christian and you've got people in your life that are unbelievers and they're asking you questions and your only answer is, well, you just got to believe, you just got to believe, or if you reject them because they're genuinely curious, you're not being like Christ to them. Christ received the teacher of his day, Nicodemus, under the cover of night and let Nicodemus come with his religious questions. Questions are allowed, but making up your mind before the answer comes is not allowed. And that's what these people were doing. So look in verse number three. In the crowd, there were people that were students, people that were skeptical, and there were people that were stumblers over Jesus. Look in verse three. Here it is. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon. And aren't these his sisters? And there's the summary statement. They took offense at him. Scandalon is the Greek noun from which this take offense verb comes from. It it means that they found Jesus's personhood, his abilities, his speaking, his wisdom. They saw all of this stuff that was being promoted in their their city and in their region. People were saying, is this the Messiah? Is this the Messiah? And they're thinking, no, it can't be the Messiah. This is Mary's boy. By the way, very quickly, in that culture and in that day, you were always known as the son of your father, never the son of your mother. But it, it could be a veiled reference because there was all sorts of scorn on Mary, you know, the young girl who supposedly had this amazing, um, miraculous conception. And there was always innuendo and murmuring about Mary that she had played the harlot, gotten pregnant. Even traditional history tells us that people thought she got pregnant by a Roman soldier. Jesus was accused. At one time, they came to him and they said, we're not, we're not born of a adultery. We know who our father is, implying that Jesus did not have any knowledge of who his father was. And so here he's being seen purely through the eyes of flesh, common, familiar. We know your brothers. We know your sisters. We watched you grow up. We don't care what we see going on. We've got our minds made up. You're Jesus from down the street. We know who you are. You know, this is a dangerous place. We're looking at this through the eyes, uh, looking backwards through the gospel, but I'm not so sure that this isn't happening in our day. I'm not so sure that we in Christendom, especially 21st century Western Christendom, haven't gotten so used to the Lord, so used to the gospel, so used to church, so used to the worship songs, so used to the hour that we begin and the hour that we must end, so used to the things that are tethered to our understanding of Christianity, I'm not so sure that we aren't perhaps guilty of stumbling over Jesus also. What does that mean? It means when he's no longer precious to us, when he's no longer glorious to us, when there's no sense of wonder attached in our worship, that it feels like duty, that it feels like obligation, that it feels like religious ritual, that it feels like we we are to do this as morally upstanding believers, and we are bound no longer by our passion for Christ, but we are bound in some sense of familiarity and obligation. I'm not so sure that that doesn't need to be applied as we study this text, because as they were stumbling over him as he presented salvation, I wonder what we're stumbling over him about as he presents something beyond our salvation to us. Surely we're not of the mindset of, well, hey, look, man, you're preaching to us about believing. Hey, we believe, dude. We sang it first song of the day. We sang it. We believe. Come on. Isn't that enough? Well, let, let, me, let me ask you a question. 
Was the moment you believed a moment of inception or a moment of termination? I do think that we are, we are gathering, and that's just, not just Meadow, but churches all over, especially down here in the Bible Belt. We are, our chairs and our pews and our sanctuaries and our classrooms and our pulpits are filled with men and women who got what they needed the moment they trusted Christ and they don't believe there's anything more. They just drill down deeper in the same place they've been standing for years and there's no advance. Well, when we're looking at these, the the main thing is that they took offense at him. Paul would testify that he once knew Jesus according to his flesh. Paul used to look at Jesus through the eyes of the flesh. The people in Nazareth were looking at Jesus through the eyes of their flesh. In other words, he was common and familiar. You know, I, I think about this stuff all the time. I have prayed on more than one occasion, not because I'm super spiritual, but really the opposite of that, because I fear this. I have prayed, Lord, it's, it's written in an old hymn, Lord, never, oh, never let me outlive my love for thee. I don't want to outlive my love for you, Lord. I don't want to go a day longer than my love for you goes. A passionless Christianity is an affront to the Christ himself. And these that were here that day could not get past the fact that they knew Jesus according to human understanding, and therefore they assumed, in spite of the testimony of others, they assumed that he had nothing to offer them. So let's move further down into the text because Jesus is actually going to respond to this. Let's move from the crowd that day to the cost that day because unbelief is costing you something. It's costing you something. I'm talking to Christians. Unbelief today is costing you something. Jesus, in verse number four, was dishonored. Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his whole own household. All the brothers and sisters that were either mentioned by name or referred to by the people in the synagogue that day, um, none of them at this point in Jesus' earthly ministry were believers, only Mary. Mary, I believe, was a believer early on. But there is testimony in Scripture that his brethren did not come to faith in him until after the resurrection. And so when Jesus is speaking, I want you to go there with me. He is speaking not only as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. He's saying, I go anywhere and they receive me. They believe my words. They trust my messages are from on high. They repent at my preaching. They believe and expect the miracles that I do. My disciples, who are not from Nazareth, when they followed me, they left all and attached themselves to me, believing me that I would bring in the kingdom. Belief was all around Jesus wherever he went except Nazareth. And when he got to Nazareth, he says in himself, a prophet will be honored except by those who think they know him best except by those in his own family. Imagine what it was like, Jesus, in these years, er, years of ministry, and his own family thought he was crazy. I believe it was just a, maybe a chapter or two earlier where they tried to drag him out of the ministry opportunity. They, they're thinking, Jesus, big brother, you have lost your mind. And so the little brothers go and get him, and, and, and they're saying, you've got to get out of this house. Come back to Nazareth. His own brothers misunderstood him. His family misunderstood him. Why why do I even belabor this point? Because I think that there is, again, an application that we can make. Geographically, we didn't grow up around Jesus. But culturally, a lot of us church folks did. Uh, In spite of my wandering years from age 14 to 24, I was a church kid. I grew up, man, I used to terrorize down in 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 the children's ministry along with all the other kids. I went to Christian camp. I went to VBS every year. I memorized the books of the Bible in order, and we sang up on Children's Church Sunday in our church in Tucker, and we, we, we worshiped the Lord and praised the Lord, and we did all the things. And listen, it, it, was, it was something we grew up in. And I thank God for people that grew up in the context of the gospel and never lived the renegade life that I chose to live during those ensuing years beginning at age 14. But my point is this. Being in a place doesn't deepen your soul. 
Being connected to a movement doesn't stretch your spirit. Coming to church, just physically getting in the the door a couple of times a week, doesn't do anything to sanctify you under the Lord. And then just as, and you've heard it said, sitting in the garage is not going to make you a motorcycle any more than sitting in a sanctuary is going to make you a spirit-filled believer. So brothers and sisters, what I'm saying is this, there's a danger for me and you. There's a danger in having good services, and we have good services around here. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago when I begged you to quit praying for good services? You know why I prayed that? Because good services are a stumbling block when we are seeking revival. Good services are like like eating too many appetizers before the main course comes. You're not hungry when the main course comes. And when we have good services and we leave and we think, man, that was a good service. The music was on. The timing was on. We saw some baptisms today. I think somebody might have repented. Uh, uh, you know, so-and-so was obviously. And we, we, start, we start scoring ourselves. Start scoring. Did this work? Did this work? Did this work? Okay, it was a good Sunday. Everybody agree? We'll raise your move in a second. Raise, we'll vote. Yep, it was a good Sunday. Okay, let's go home. There's a familiarity. And the question that we've got to ask ourselves is, did Jesus move in our midst? Did Jesus do the works in our midst today that he did when he was walking the earth? Do you know that we can have church in the 21st century and experience none of the things that Jesus did when he was ministering on earth and we'll call it a success? Let me tell you the three things that Jesus did. This is free. This doesn't cost you a dime extra. It's not in the notes. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom, not just pray this prayer and go to heaven. He preached the kingdom. He he, he preached, leave that kingdom and come into my kingdom and follow me the rest of your days. That's the message that Jesus preached. Jesus cast out demons. He reversed the stronghold of Satan. See, Baptists get scared when you start talking about that stuff, but that's what he did. He eradicated and reversed the work of the enemy who came against the people that, that, that he hated. So Satan's working to kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus says, I'll have none of that. And Jesus healed the sick. So, and if you want to add the fourth, the result of that for those that believed was, was life transformation. And we can, we can have Sunday service after Sunday service after Sunday service and never see any of those things and say, but it was a good service. But if we have faith and we start figuring out the way it works, we'll say we can't be satisfied until we know that Jesus was among us doing what Jesus does. So let's go further. The cost that day was that he was dishonored. By the way, uh, look, look in verse number five. It wasn't just that he was dishonored, he was denied. Now, verse number five will blow your mind, especially if you're a Calvinist. So all my Calvinist friends, I want you to listen right here. The Bible says of the omnipotent son of God that he could do no mighty work there. You know what it says in the Greek? He could do no mighty work there. That's what the Bible says when Mark was writing this. Do you know what the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write? That Jesus in Nazareth, because of their stumbling and taking offense at him, Jesus could not do a mighty work there. Man, that messes with my head. Because Jesus is omnipotent. He doesn't have to ask anybody's permission. But Jesus always did those things what he saw the Father doing. He always did those things which pleased the Father. And the Father, it would seem was not going to cast his pearls before the swine. In other words, the Father wasn't going to grant through Jesus a mighty work unto these people who would not even reverence Jesus, nor believe him, nor trust him. So in essence, follow me here, don't don't you go running the rabbit trail of God's sovereignty on this. We're not talking about God's sovereignty right now. We're talking about man's lack of faith. We, we spend more time talking about God's sovereignty in this house than we do man's lack of faith. Today, we're going to turn the coin over. There's another side to it. And the fact of the matter is, the Bible says that Jesus came there and he couldn't do a mighty work. You know what the implication of that is? He couldn't do all that he was willing to do. He couldn't do all that he was able to do. He couldn't do all that they needed him to do. Because in his infinite plan of how he works, he attaches the, unre- the releasing, the unveiling, the unleashing, if you will, of his own power. He ties that to our desire for it. He could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. 
good night. That'd make the bulletin the next week in most churches. I mean, Jesus saw that as a down day. We'd be like, yeah, hallelujah. You know why? I don't think we believe him. Listen to me. I'm not being critical. When I said, I didn't say I don't think you believe them. I'm talking about us collectively. I'm not even talking about this church. I'm talking about the people of God, the New Testament Christian living in the 21st century does not believe in the Jesus of the Bible. We, we, look, we believe a little bit about him. But that, yep, let me take a little bit. Of, matter of fact, let's take twice as much of that because I really like that part. We'll put that in there. And, uh, ooh, let's redline that. Get that out of the way. Highlight, delete, insert something different. Lord, help me this morning. In the name of Jesus, help me this morning. See, brothers and sisters, we never will choose the right path until we're convinced we're on the wrong one. We'll never start heading in the proper direction until we see this as an, in, in, uh, a lesser, a substandard direction. I'm not even dealing with whether or not we're saved here. I'm not saying that you aren't justified by the Lord. But if we believe that, well, hey, man, you can't say that because I'm saved, we're missing the point. The point is not, did you get your ticket punched to heaven? The point is, is are you walking in the fullness of the kingdom that the king himself is offering to you? And if I'm not walking in the fullness of the kingdom, then I am, I am missing out on what he wants to do. And it's not because he doesn't want to do it. It's because in some way I'm resembling the people at Nazareth and I'm saying, I, I just don't know if I believe that. I, I like the fact that just a few chapters later, Jesus met another guy that was struggling to believe, but his struggle was very different. Jesus comes down off the Mount of Transfiguration. He's had a great time up there. Got affirmation from the Father. Moses and Elijah were worshiping the Son of God. Peter messed up up there, but that's okay because there's grace for Peter just like there's grace for you. And so they come down off the mountain, and then when they get to the bottom of the mountain, there's this father who's with the other nine disciples, and everybody's standing around with their hands in their pockets, and the Pharisees are over in the corner laughing because the remaining disciples can't deliver this boy from the demon. And Jesus had already authorized to do what? For them to deliver the boy from the demon. But they couldn't do it. And so the Pharisees are having a big old time because that's what unbelievers do when believers don't walk in the power that they say God has given them. Amen? Y'all miss that completely, but it'll come again. You'll have another chance. When we don't walk in the power that we say God gives us, the unbelievers stand back and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, I want to be a Christian because it seems to them to be theoretical. A, a lot of doctrine, but not a lot of power. A lot of talk, but not a lot of walk. A, a, a lot of words, but not a lot of action. And so they come down off the mountain, and so this father is saying there, and, and he says, I brought my lunatic son to your disciples. He has a demon. The demon throws him in the fire. The demon torments him, and, and uh, your disciples couldn't do anything about it. And Jesus says, how long has it been this way? Well, since he's a little boy. And the father says, and if you can do anything, please help us. Isn't that amazing that the ineptitude of the disciples cast such a negative light on the Messiah that the man's response was, I don't even know if the Messiah can do anything. And Jesus looked at him and says, if you can, and he gives him this, all things are possible to him that believes. Jesus said, all things are possible to him that believes. All things are possible to him that believes. And so this man cries out, Lord, I do believe. Please help me with the areas I do not believe. In other words, Lord, there's a struggle within me. It's almost that thing we've all been there. Lord, I, I believe you can, but I'm not real sure that you will. And, and, and I believe you're able, but I'm not real sure that you're willing. And, and I know you've done it for others, but I'm not real sure how that's going to apply to me. And so we have this belief-unbelief dynamic, this tension going on inside of it. And, and here's what I'm trying to tell you today. What I'm trying to tell you today is the Lord not only, not only wants us to believe that he can, but that he will. That, that not that he used to and he's gonna, but that he does. Not, not that he's the God of the Old Testament, he's going to be the God of the apocalypse, and right now he's kind of a lukewarm God that can't make up his mind about his own identity. No, that he's, he's God and he never changes. The, the great I am, the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And that the works that Jesus said, John 14, 12, he said, the works that I do, you will do, and greater works than these you will do. So this is what Jesus is saying, and what I'm asking us... 
What I'm asking the body of Christ is, why don't we believe him? Why are there conferences held to debate this? Why are there people getting up in arms and getting all knotted up in their intestines and all spiritually constipated and all just messed up because there's a group of people in the body of Christ that are saying, we just believe God's still God. We just believe in the divine, supernatural, amazing, wondrous, stupendous, mind-blowing God of the Bible. That, that's what I'm saying. And, and, and there just seems to be this, well, you know, I, I don't know. They didn't know at Nazareth, and guess what? They got what they didn't believe in. Be it unto you according to your faith. God gets a lot of blame. The devil gets a lot of credit, and God gets a lot of blame. Friends, I, I, I'm going to just step out on this thing. Sometimes when the power of God's not happening... And the breakthrough hasn't come. Sometimes when the prayer is not answered. Sometimes when the wandering in the wilderness goes on for another year. It's because we don't believe. It's because we don't care to break through the barrier of unbelief. That we don't want to go there, that we don't want to face it, that we don't want to risk being disappointed. Oh, Jeff, what happens if I really give my heart and I really believe for this breakthrough and I really believe for this miracle? And, and what if God doesn't do it? I don't, I don't want to go through that. Well, then, then you not only need faith, you need courage. You know, Moses standing in front of the Red Sea. I don't know if I'm ever getting back to the outline today. I'm sorry, but I'm just... Moses standing in front of the Red Sea. I mean, Brother Moses had really gone through. He didn't even want the assignment. He's at the burning bush, and he's trying to talk God out of God calling him. God calls him. He goes to Pharaoh. Things get worse. Things get difficult. And then finally, breakthrough happens after the plague of the slaying of the firstborn. And so they're free, and the Egyptians are you know, giving them their American Express cards and just saying, get out, do whatever you got to do. We'll rent you a van. Just get out of Egypt. And so they're free. They're rejoicing, and they're celebrating. And then they come up against the Red Sea, and the Red Sea's not going anywhere. And all of a sudden, they hear the sound of eight-cylinder chariots roaring behind them. Them. And Pharaoh's coming. And Moses is stuck between an army and the Red Sea, and neither one of them are going home. And both of them are threatening to swallow Moses and the Israelites. And Moses is sitting there, and he's crying out to God. And God just says, you see that stick in your hand? Yeah, I see the stick in my hand. Why don't you just stretch it out and watch what I do? Moses had to lift his hand. Moses had to engage in faith. Moses had to risk looking like a fool. Because I'm going to tell you, I wasn't real good at science, but I did get this much. A stick doesn't part a sea. <laughs> but God does. Amen. But only when we raise the stick. Did God need Moses to do it? No, God just chooses to partner with you. God can do everything without us. God was perfectly, inherently self-sufficient and pleased and content before he ever made an angel or ever made a human being. He's always been good. It's a wonderful part about being perfect. He's never needed anything. He was self-sustained, self-satisfying, self-sufficient. All of the created order was so that we could experience his goodness. And when he made Adam in the garden, he didn't make Adam to be, uh, you know, just, just down there kind of meandering around while God went on to the next project. He wanted to be with Adam. God likes to be with people. He likes to partner with people. He likes you to learn him and to participate with him and to grow intimate with him and to enjoy him, which is the high calling on all of our lives. But in order to do that, it requires faith. Brothers and sisters, some of us are wired, and I count myself in this number. Some of us are wired that we would never pursue faith if God always gave us what we wanted and never challenged us. So he puts some red seas in your path, and he puts some opportunities to stumble. And sometimes when we don't believe him, he does no mighty work. Verse 6 tells us that Jesus was dismayed. The Bible says that he marveled at their unbelief. Very seldom in the Gospels do you find moments where the Scriptures focus on an emotional reaction of Jesus Christ. Uh, I, I think we could probably put this statement in under emotional or at least intellectual mental. Jesus was blown away at the degree of their non-trust of him. 
He was blown away. At other times in the scripture, he's actually blown away by the degree of someone's proactive faith. And the less familiar they were with him, it seemed the more easily they were to believe, or the more easy it was for them to believe. But the closer you got to home, to family, to Nazareth, with people that were familiar with Jesus and the cadence of his voice and his physical appearance and how he walked and moved, it was harder and harder for them to believe because they're around him all the time. And when you're around something all the time and you lose that sense of it being special, it's hard to rekindle that specialness. And so Jesus is looking at them and literally, I mean, this is, an, uh, this is a peek behind the curtain at the mind of God. You peek behind the curtain and Jesus is in essence, please, I hope this is not offensive, but he's standing there and he's saying, I cannot believe your lack of trust in me. I cannot believe you can't trust me for this. And there, thank God in the midst of a whole city where people didn't believe him, there seems to be a couple of people that believe because he did heal a few sick people. But it seems that he was offering something spectacular to that city. And because of the predominant atmosphere of unbelief, there was no great breakthrough. Here's something. For the self-sufficient, independent, 21st century, capable American Christian, we are so infected in our culture from this, you know, I call it Simon and Garfunkel theology. I am a rock. I am an island, and, and we just stand by ourselves. You keep over there, you keep over there. You, we're all in the same sea, but don't touch me. Don't connect with me. Don't get in my space. You do your thing, I'll do my thing. And that's, that's foreign to the New Testament concept of koinonia, which says we are one. It doesn't say we should be one, it says we are one. And, and brothers and sisters, what, what's amazing is whole communities of faith can, uh, they can ebb and flow according to the predominant atmosphere of that assembly. So in other words, if you got half the assembly believing God for great things and the other half not believing for great things, you're probably going to be a whole lot of back and forth, start and stop kind of stuff. Whereas if you get some simple folks, and let's just say 75, 80% of them are believing God for a revival, that kind of faith, that titanic pursuit of God, God is going to do something great in the midst of those people. So this is what I'm trying to say. My faith affects you. My expectancy of what God will do affects the person sitting on the third row, second seat from the center. Whoever you are, I wasn't looking at you, but I'm just giving a hypothetical here. My faith, what I believe, what I'm pursuing, what I'm expecting, what I'm preparing for, what I'm looking for actually does have an impact on my wife and my kids and and my staff and, and my church family and my community and my neighborhood and my school if I'm a teenager and, 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 and my influence. And so Simon and Garfunkel got it wrong for the Christian. And so I think to myself, it's not just me and Jesus. Jesus saved me as an individual, but Jesus saved me into the church where my life is not my own. It's not only his, but part of my life belongs to others. And so as we see this moving forward, Jesus is standing, he's looking at them, and he's, he, he, the Bible just says that he was stunned because they couldn't trust him. Um, can I make it personal and practical for you? I don't, I'm not going to ask you if you've got something that you're wrestling with because we almost always do. What's your level of trusting him? Because the way it works sometimes, almost always, the way it works is that he works through our faith. He works through it. Faith is a pipe, and if doubt clogs the pipe, what he's pouring through doesn't come all the way through. If fear clogs the pipe, if pride, and that's a big old stinking nasty clog, if pride clogs the pipe, if an unteachable spirit clogs the pipe, then what he's seeking to press through never makes it through. It just gets backed up. 
Jesus was dismayed. So what's he going to do? What's he going to do? Because, hey, friends, there's a caricature of Jesus in the 21st century. He's just you know, real sweet. And he's permissive and indulgent. And, well, you didn't think right this time, but you'll get another chance. I'll come back. Let me just go ahead and tell you something. He never went back to Nazareth. That was it. He said, I have come. He actually went twice, presented himself to them in his messianic fullness. The first time they tried to kill him, the second time they just said, well, we're not going to kill him because that didn't work real well last time, but um, this can't be what we're looking for because it's just Jesus. And so the Bible teaches us right here, last few points, Look at the continuance from that day because, oh my goodness, this is, to me, it's frightening. He just moved on. He just left them. He, he just let them stew in their unbelief. He went on to a new people. He continued to a new people, verse 6. And he went about among the villages teaching. Isn't that crazy? He didn't force himself upon anybody. It is almost as if he said, hey, You don't want to believe me. It's clear that you don't want to believe me. I can't believe that you don't want to believe me and trust me and receive me. But I'm going to honor your rejection. I'm going to honor your stubborn heart. I'm going to leave you right where you are. And he left them. He said, well, Jeff, what about that promise? I will never leave thee, forsake forsake thee. Well, if we're going to make a a spiritual application, he's not going to jerk your salvation out of you, but he'll let you live as one who is an unbeliever. He'll let you live in your own lack of faith, and you'll you'll have the the same spiritual produce from your life as an unsaved person uh, would have. You won't see any breakthrough. You won't experience the fruit of the Spirit. You'll never operate in the gifts of the Spirit. You'll never see great and mighty works. You'll never make a kingdom difference. If we don't trust God, we will never make a kingdom difference. All we can do is try to ratchet up some really good, humanly energized forces of religiosity, and we can say we had a good Sunday. And I'm going to tell you something. Not only do you not want that for your life, but Jesus doesn't want that for us either. He will move on. Uh, I think our experience in churches is that all of us have either been in or know of churches where the Lord moved on. I know we don't like this kind of teaching, but forgive me for being really honest with you, but this is reality. Where, where, where Jesus just moves on from a church. He's like, well, y'all are handling this without me, and you're satisfied, so there's really no expectation for me to do anything other than what y'all are doing in your own power, so I'm going to move on. And he'll go down the street, and he'll visit a group of people with no budget and no building and no beauty, but they have a Bible, and they'll begin to blossom. Oh, I got my B alliteration going on right now. And he'll go in there with a bunch of people, you know, in a garage somewhere crying out for the power of God and the Holy Spirit will descend on that place and neighborhoods will get converted and churches will be born. Why? Because they knew they needed him. He'll come into a situation. Now, this is difficult for me because my wife and my children and I and many of you are praying for a healing in Amy's body that hasn't come yet. But do you know why we pray every day? Because we believe him. Do you know when we'll prove we don't believe him? When we quit praying. She will need a miracle for that leg to work. It's crushed, metal on metal, 40 miles an hour, coming one way, 40 going another, snapped it, almost tore it off. In order for her to dance on this stage unto Jesus one day, there will need to be a restoring miracle. I pursue him because I believe him. That does not make me spiritual. It makes me convinced that what he does in the Bible, he'll do now. And brothers and sisters, here's the thing. (laughs) I feel like I'm arguing. 
I, I probably am. I don't know if I'm arguing with you, but I do know I'm arguing against unbelief because unbelief is a liar and unbelief robs my savior of glory and unbelief keeps people live, living in a subpar Christian life and unbelief steals your joy and unbelief sours your family and unbelief stifles the work of the Holy Spirit in the, in the midst of a generation that needs to see God. And so yeah, I guess I am arguing and I'd, if I could see it, I'd try to knock it out, man, because unbelief is from the abyss. Son of God comes, born of a virgin, lives a sinless life. 30 years in anonymity, the father says, now go baptize him, father, son, and spirit at the baptism of Jesus. Three and a half years of miracle working ministry, raising the dead, opening the eyes of the blind, causing the mute to speak, making the deaf hear. He has power over nature as he walks over the waves and curses a fig tree. He's got provisional miraculous power as he feeds the hungry hillside twice with fish and bread. He, 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 is, he takes upon himself the form of a servant, is made in the likeness of man, humbles himself unto death, becomes obedient unto death, on even the death of the cross. And so he goes the way of all men, taking upon himself the curse and the wrath of the Father in his body. They place him visibly dead, physically dead, in a tomb. Three days later, he exits the tomb, presents himself alive, and shows people time after time, I am alive, I am alive. The message of the early church is, Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive, Jesus is alive. And so his whole life is one long miracle. And now here we are 2,000 years later, and if we can't explain it, we don't believe it. That is wrong. I don't even have a big word for it. It's just straight up wrong. And some of you want to believe them. Some of you really, really want to believe him. And you're waiting on permission. Maybe you're married to somebody who scoffs at him. I recommend you believe Jesus anyway. Maybe you've got kids who think you're a lunatic because you're a religious mom or dad. I just recommend that you believe Jesus anyway. Maybe you've been brought up and you've been spiritually and religiously oppressed by a denominational stand that the miraculous doesn't happen anymore. I just, I just recommend you believe Jesus and his word anyway. And, and, and maybe that the hunger in your heart, maybe the breakthrough that you've craved and wished for is a big gulf between seeking God in faith and wishing something might happen. <sighs> Forget the wish. Pursue, believe, and see if the mighty work doesn't come. You say, well, Jeff, I have been believing him. Well, what does have been mean? Because that sounds incredibly like past tense to me. You're not done yet. So a new paradigm comes in verses 7 through 11. He moves on, and look what he does. Verse 7. He calls the 12, sends them out two by two. He gives them authority over the unclean spirits. In other words, he says, don't worry about the devil. Now, I don't know if you woke up worrying about the devil. I didn't. You know why? Because my Bible tells me not to. Because greater is he that is in me than the one that is in the world. So stop giving the devil credit for messing up your life. Because he can't. The devil can't mess you up. Oh, can he afflict? He can come against you. Can he roar? He can roar. He can make a lot of noise, but the lion's on a short leash, and I know the hand of the one that's holding it. So he gave him authority over the unclean spirits, and he charged them, take nothing for your journey. Ooh, not too many of us are doing that. We're saying, well, you know, my journey is about taking and keeping and guarding and insulating and preserving. And Jesus said, no, if you really want breakthrough faith, give as much away as you can. Travel lightly. He says, stay where you stay, verse 10. And he says, if anybody doesn't receive you and doesn't listen to you, well, look what he told the disciples to do. Watch this. He tells them to do what he did in Nazareth. If any place, that's, that's not an individual. He says, if you get in a scenario where most of the people will not receive you, and will not listen to you, he didn't just say you might want to leave. He assumes they will leave. Inherent in it is a command to leave. He says, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. Watch this. Whew. Jesus says that we don't have to stay in a place where he's not honored. 
We don't have to keep begging people to believe. We don't have to keep fighting. There comes a point where some of us have to decide, they don't want what you want, Lord Jesus. And Jesus told these disciples, when that occurs, as you go, don't go quietly. Let them know why you, while you're leaving. He says, take off your shoes, your sandals, Shake the dust from their city off of it because you don't want to take any of that, that dirt with you. Put them back on and leave. Why is that significant? It's significant to me in a lot of ways. Why should it be significant to you? Because you don't have enough years to waste trying to beg people, trying to convince people, trying to cajole people, trying to force people into spirituality. There comes a time where God has prepared a new people for you. And there comes a time where your faith will propel you to go to different places. A word to the wise is sufficient. And the disciples received it. And then we get down to the end of it. And I'm going to be done. There was a new power. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. Whew. Man. We need some good repentance sermons, don't we? I don't have time to preach one. Otherwise, I'd just tag one to this message right now because I've already made you mad. They went out and proclaimed that people should repent. So they didn't pat them on the head and told them it's their best day now and told them everything's going to be great and just try harder and smile and be positive and get your teeth whitened. And they just went out there and they said, repent. What, repent of what? Not believing in one form or another. Unbelief. And then verse number 13, they cast out many demons. Oh, I reckon they did it because that's what Jesus did. And they anointed with oil many who were sick, and they healed them. I guess they healed people because that's what Jesus did. So what did they do? They went out with the word. They proclaimed that people should repent. That's the authority of the objective truth of the gospel, the word. And they also had the power because they cast out demons, and they healed the sick. I'm going to make this statement, and I'm actually going to close the service. I'm just going to let you think on these things. We are living in a time and in a culture and in a world where they have heard everything that Christians have to say. We're not saying anything new. You don't improve upon the gospel. The message has not changed and will not change. Let me tell you, what needs to accompany the word, power.